Hi there, it is Wednesday, December 8th. This is Hanby 8th grade English language arts. My name is Mr. Newman, and this is today's class recap. So uh, we're gonna start today. Let's look at our planner. If you would take out your Hanby student planner and record what you see. Go ahead and pause the video if you need to do this. Um, so we're going to start today, we're going to have some time in No Red Ink, and I'll pause for you to work in No Red Ink. Um, but we're going to start with a, a further explanation of who versus whom. And I'm going to play a YouTube video that explains this. And so we'll put part of it on. Um, but I want to start this by saying if you are, so several students are struggling with who versus whom in No Red Ink. Um, and so I just want to clarify for you if at the end of this video, you feel like you got it, there's an out, like, good job. If you feel like you're even more confused, um, we've got a workaround, and I'll talk about that too. But we're gonna, whoops, we're gonna go at this link right here. So who versus whom? So let's bring up this video and take a look. It's getting boring. We need to find the shield of disappointment, Harry. Yeah, I hope we find it soon. Yeah, me too. I heard it's really good and I'm very excited. Shh, keep your voice down. You know who might hear us. Actually, it's you know whom. No, it's not. Wait, is it? You know whom, you know who. Look, honestly, no one cares. No one cares. This is why no one wants to go on adventures with us. This, you. When is it who and when is it whom? Also, in 2018, who even uses whom really? Whom uses whom? Is it who or whom? Remember to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Papa Teach Me. Or if you want to support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so by joining my Patreon page, where you will get regular PDF worksheets to improve your English. Okay, before we specifically look at who and whom, you need to know one very important thing. Look at this sentence. In this sentence, this is called the subject. The subject does the action. In this case, love. Her, that's the object. Now the object of a sentence receives the action. So she receives the love. Okay, so this is really important what he's talking about. So he's basically saying in a sentence, there is someone who is someone or something that is doing something. And then there's someone who's receiving. Okay. And so what we want to think about is there's always, um, there's always a like an action that has to take place. So in a sentence, there has to be someone or something that is doing something that someone or something is the subject. Okay, let's look at this again. She receives the love. So subject does the action, object receives the action. Super easy, right? Mm, yeah. And you'll notice whether it's a subject pronoun or an object pronoun, it has a different form. For example, let's reverse this. So the feminine she is a subject pronoun and the feminine her is the object pronoun. And the masculine he, that's a subject, and the masculine him is the object pronoun. Who and whom work the same way. Who and whom, they're both pronouns. Who is a subject pronoun. Whom is an object pronoun. We need an example. So this question, is it who loves me or whom loves me? What do you think? You see, it's actually super easy. We want to know who does the action. So we need who, not whom. We can test this by looking at the answer. She loves me. If the answer is a subject pronoun, then you need who, because who is the subject pronoun. Whom is the object pronoun, but how do we use it? Okay, this question. Who do you love? Or should it be whom do you love? Well, we know that 
He is doing the action, so he's the subject, right? We want to know who receives this action. So actually, that should be whom. Whom do you love? That's how we use it. It's that simple. So why is it so confusing? Well, it's because you would never hear this question in real life. That's why. And the reason is that whom, it's becoming old-fashioned. We don't use it really anymore. It's much more common to hear who do you love, not whom. Basically, basically, who <coughs> is replacing whom in all situations. In formal writing, yes, when it's appropriate, when you need the object pronoun, sure, use whom. But in all cases, who is slowly replacing whom. Another example, who did you invite? We want to know who received the invitation. So actually, that again is the object pronoun. But again, you're not going to hear, whom did you invite to the party in regular speech? No. Who did you invite? That's much more common. That's what you'll hear. And I recommend that that is what you say. Now, of course, there are annoying people who will always correct who to whom in conversation. It sounds annoying and it's rude. Let whom die with one exception, two exceptions. I mentioned formal writing. Yes, that's fine. The other one is this situation. Who are you talking to? We already know that this one, that's an object pronoun. So in theory, should be whom are you talking to? That doesn't sound good. Oh, I know, it's because you never end a sentence with a preposition. Let's change that. To whom are you talking? That, ugh, ugh. Why? It sounds very old fashioned and very formal. If someone said that in conversation, to whom am I talking? What century do you live in? Oh, I'm sorry. In which century do you live? Okay, so we're going to pause with that. So if that made sense to you, like you were on the brink of understanding this, you watch this, you're like, oh, great. So here's the deal. When you do your practice in no red ink, if that made sense to you and you are able to master who versus whom in no red ink, you will earn a 12 out of 10. So you get two points of extra credit on the practice. And on the quiz, who and whom will not be there. Okay, so there's no who and whom on the quiz, okay? If, however, you are completely confused, don't worry about it. Do your best on the practice. I will let you move on to the quiz without showing mastery, mastery in who and whom, okay? So if you get it, you get two points extra credit. If you don't get it, it's not gonna hurt you as soon as you complete the assignment, showing mastery with the other commonly confused words, um, you'll be able to move on and take the quiz both of which are due next Wednesday. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the planner. Um, I'm gonna pause the video and give you a chance. You can, on the planner, you can, um, if you've opened this through Google Classroom, and just a reminder, you know, the planner sits right here. Um, so if you've opened this, I'm gonna pause while you work in No Red Ink for 15 minutes. Remember, you are working on the assignment, Commonly Confused Words. Okay, welcome back. I hope that No Red Ink went well for you. I hope that you are less confused than you were before. There is a reason that we are looking at these words. Um, and remember that this process, in this process of reevaluating commonly confused words, it's like if you're using these words wrong and you get confused by being taught the correct way, you effectively have to reteach your brain. So your brain says, no, I should do it this way. And you have to be like, oh no, that's not right. I have to reteach to make sure that I'm using these things correctly. You will get to a point where you are surrounded by people who will have a certain expectation of your ability to communicate. And you wanna make sure that at that point, um, and that's, you know, you guys are headed to bigger and brighter things. Um, it could be that you join the military and your commanding officer. Uh, sees that you are someone who speaks clearly and uses good grammar and that propels you forward in promotions. It could be that you're in a job. It could be when you're in college. Um, so there are a lot of things, but we want to make sure and remember 
great grammar, it doesn't happen all at once. It's an incremental process. We do this a little bit at a time. Sometimes we're just reinforcing our own good habits. Other times we have to change them. Okay, so for our next phase here, um, we're gonna go to um, pages R18 and R19 in your notebook, and we're gonna record some notes there. So in Google Classroom, there is a notes template. It says R18 to R19 setup, and that thing looks like this. So what you're gonna do is this. On page R18, uh, you're gonna divide your page into six semi-equal boxes, and you're gonna do the same thing on R19. So if I hold up my notebook together, see if I can get that totally in the ca camera, what you'll see is that there are four boxes, three rows of four, essentially. And the lettering goes across the top, A, B, C, D, the next row, E, F, J, H, and so on and so forth. So you, you should end up with 12 boxes, okay? So would you pause a moment and record that on your notebook on page 18 and 19? You're gonna use that for class today. All right, when you have that set up and you're coming back to the video, Let's talk about what we're gonna do. So if we look at our goal for today, I can collaborate to visualize, evaluate, and predict, okay? So if you were in class today, you were working with other students um, and there's a discussion element and really you know, working together to pull this out. If you're doing this outside of class, you're doing this on your own, but you can still get a lot of the same stuff from it. So uh, in these boxes that are in your notebook, okay? In each of the boxes, you're going to do different things. It's a little bit like an informed or annotated graphic novel. Okay, so we're going to read this story. It's called The Landlady. It's by Roald Dahl, the same person who wrote Lamb to the Slaughter. And it's, I will tell you, it is my, probably my favorite creepy story. Okay, not like Silence of the Lambs creepy or The Shining or anything like that, but creepy like you'll get it. Okay, so I made an audiobook of this. It is in Google Classroom. Okay, today, uh, for today's class, we read about through, and there's also a, um, there's a print version of it, and we read through about line 80 on the first page, so not that far. And my request to you is don't read the whole thing. Wait to do it in class, okay? But let's look at the beginning and decide what to do. So I'm going to post the audio book up here, and we'll actually listen to the first part of it. But my question for you, and you're gonna describe this in box A. So in the upper left in your notebook, in box A, your question is, who is Billy? Okay, who is Billy? And in box A, you are going to sketch an image of Billy, labeling it with specific details from the text. Okay, so remember, I'm gonna play the audiobook so you can hear it, you can also go back afterwards into this one and, and you'll notice that the it it doesn't say the landlady, but the link says teachingenglish.org, uh, okay? So let's listen. Who is Billy? The Landlady by Roald Dahl. Billy Weaver had traveled down from London on the slow afternoon train with a change at Swindon on the way. And by the time he got to Bath, it was about nine o'clock in the evening and the moon was coming up out of a clear, starry sky over the houses opposite the station entrance. But the air was deadly cold, and the wind was like a flat blade of ice on his cheeks. Excuse me, he said, but is there a fairly cheap hotel not far away from here? Try the Bell and Dragon, the porter answered, pointing down the road. They might take you in. It's about a quarter of a mile along the other side. Billy thanked him and picked up his suitcase and set out to walk the quarter mile to the Bell and Dragon. He'd never been to Bath before. He didn't know anyone who lived there, but Mr. Greenslade at the head office in London had told him it was a splendid city. Find your own lodgings, he'd said. Then go along and report to the branch manager as soon as you've got yourself settled. Billy was 17 years old. He was wearing a new navy blue overcoat a new brown tribbly hat, and a new brown suit, and he was feeling fine. He walked briskly down the street. He was trying to do everything briskly these days. Briskness, he had decided, was the one common characteristic of all successful businessmen. 
The big shots up at the head office were absolutely fantastically brisk all the time. They were amazing. Okay, so again, question for you in this section, and you are doing this um, on R18 right here. So who is Billy? On R18, draw a picture of who you think he is. Include details from the text. So what does he look like? What's your impression of him? And again, we're trying to form mental images as we read here, right? So there are details in here. Um, there's some details in you know, this paragraph that's right between 20 and 40. He's 17 years old. He's wearing a new navy blue overcoat, okay? There are other things that you kind of have to infer, like what kind of kid is he? He's really impressed with the big shots you know, at the office who are brisk. This is probably his first job away from home. Like, what does that picture look like? If you're a great artist, you're gonna obsess over this. You don't have time for that. If you're a terrible artist like me and you're writing stick figures, but you're doing little arrows to identify things like, oh, this is his trilby hat or, oh, this is this or that, that's great, okay? But take a few minutes, go ahead, pause the video. And again, remember answering the question. So who is Billy? Sketch his appearance and key details about him, background and appearance in box A. Go ahead and pause while you do this. Okay, we are now going to box B. So A is top left, B is the next one over, still on the top line. In box B, I wanna share a vocabulary word that we're gonna see later on in the story. And that word is facade okay so you can see on the right this is how facade is written and it's not if we look on the left here it would be facade right that's how we'd pronounce it but facade is a french word and there's this little symbol underneath the c and if you zoom in on it what it looks like is if i sketch the number five right five Okay. If I sketch the number five, it would be like a five symbol, but without this top line. So I draw my C like this, and then I just do this thing underneath that's like a five. And that's what that symbol is. So what that does is it softens the C. It's not a K sound, it's a S sound. So we get facade. So what a facade is, is it's the face of a building that looks onto a street or open space. It's basically the front face of a building. Now, in most houses that we have around us, the front and the sides and everything, that all looks the same. But if you go into downtown Medford or downtown Central Point or downtown Ashland, what you'll see is that there's kind of a fancy part on the front of the building, and then the sides and back are pretty plain because that's not what people see. So what people see is the facade. So in box B, would you write the definition here for facade and then maybe sketch what a facade looks like? Now, these are some fancy ones, kind of cool. If you Google facade and then look at images, this one here is my favorite, um, just the optical illusion that that creates. Um, and if you just needed to draw a picture of a house with an arrow that says facade, that's the front, that would work fine. Okay, go ahead and pause while you do that. Okay, so our third part for box C, and we're gonna pick up with C in class tomorrow. So I want you to listen to the story going forward, and then uh, there'll be a point where I'm gonna stop you and tell you what I want you to try to visualize for box C. Let's listen where we left off. There were no shops on this wide street that he was walking along, only a line of tall houses on each side all of them identical. They had porches and pillars and four or five steps going up to their front doors. It was obvious that once upon a time they'd been very swanky residences, but now even in the darkness, he could see that the paint was peeling from the woodwork on their doors and windows and that the handsome white facades were cracked and blotchy from neglect. Suddenly, in a downstairs window that was brilliantly illuminated by a street lamp not six yards away, Billy caught sight of a printed notice propped up against the glass in one of the upper panes. It said, Bed and Breakfast. There was a vase of yellow chrysanthemums, tall and beautiful, standing just underneath the notice. Okay, in this next section, and this is where we're going to pick up tomorrow, 
Uh, the question is, what do you see in this setting? So what is the visual image that pops in your head? Okay. And then what feeling, like what does that image feel like to you? What feeling does it communicate? All right, let's listen further. Green curtains, some of vel velvety material were hanging down on either side of the window. The chrysanthemums looked wonderful beside them. He went right up and peered through the glass into the room, and the first thing he saw was a bright fire burning in the hearth. On the carpet in front of the fire was a pretty little dachshund, was curled up asleep with its nose tucked into its belly. The room itself, so far as he could see in the half-darkness, was filled with pleasant furniture. There was a baby grand piano and a big sofa and several plump armchairs, and in one corner he spotted a large parrot in a cage. Animals were usually a good sign in a place like this, Billy told himself. And all in all, it looked as though it would be a pretty decent house to stay in. Certainly, it would be more comfortable than the Bell and Dragon. Okay, so here's your parting thought. Going back, what does that room, what is that experience, what does that feel like? Okay, but also how would you describe it? What's there? What's that picture? That's where we'll start class tomorrow. Okay. So going back to our planner, we are working on uh, collaborating to visualize, evaluate, and predict with an emphasis on visualize. Good work today. I will see you tomorrow.